Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. One thing your pastor didn't tell you when he introduced me is I'm a Southern Baptist boy. <laughs> Born and raised in the Southern Baptist Church up in North Carolina. But something that came aware to me recently, my sister and I were working on our genealogy, and my sister found this report that our great, great, great grandfather was involved in physically building a Methodist church up in Rockingham County, North Carolina, back in the early 1800s. Well, learning that, I shared that with your pastor, and his reply was, well, what went wrong with you? <laughs> so when he invited me to come and deliver a message, he said, maybe if you come here, you'll come back where you belong. <laughs> Now, I will tell you, in honor and respect of him, something I learned, I am not wearing shoes this morning. <laughs> but I don't have any Star Vader socks, Michael. <laughs> the scripture, all the believers were together and had everything in common, that was written about 2,000 years ago. Before, there were Methodists and Baptists and Lutherans and all those things that happened. But did you know it's still happening today? I come from a church plant just a mile down the road, Calvary Chapel. We were planted here April 1st of this year, not even a year old yet. We rent out the fellowship hall of the Wildwood Assembly of God. And we have that room for four hours on Sunday morning, and that's all we have. So when we want to do things like have a Bible study on a Tuesday night or have a fellowship on a Saturday morning, we either have to go out under the trees or just not have it. Well, as I was sharing the concerns and the growth that we were experiencing with our church with your pastor, he responded with such generosity and said, we got plenty of space, come on over here. So thank you. Now, our church hearing about that we're so touched that another church was reaching out to us. They got to thinking, we want to be a part of that too. So some connections were made. And a few months ago, when you were renovating your fellowship hall, our ladies brought lunch for you every Saturday before. Doesn't it sound just like that first century church? Doesn't matter what we call ourselves, we gather together for the purposes of God. I bring a message to you this morning titled Generosity, a Feeling, or a Question, or a Decision. I'm going to present this perhaps a little bit differently because I'm going to share with you my journey, my testimony, and where God has started and where He has led me over the past few years in teaching me about generosity. And here's where my story started, back in that small Southern Baptist church in the 50s. And I so appreciate the seeds they planted in my heart of the Word of God. Because I went astray for a while, but I came back. But I remember back in that time, both in our church and in my home, there were lots of things that we didn't talk about. And I remember, I always had an interest in money. I remember asking my dad a question about money or something the Bible said, and my dad would reply to me, son, we don't talk about that in this house. Lots of things we didn't talk about. So I grew up with a very limited understanding of what God and money meant. Now I do remember in that church being taught about the tithe, and that the tithe belonged to God, and how it was supposed to work. And when I got my first job at 11 years old as a paper boy, I knew to take a dime out of every dollar and put it in the offering plate. But you know the message that I heard from our church back then? It wasn't a message of God's generosity. <coughs> what I remember was a verse from the Old Testament. You better not get caught stealing from God. And I thought, well, I guess God takes this pretty seriously. And so most of my adult life, I was just very careful <coughs> that I didn't do anything with money that I would stand before God and feel like I have done it wrong. That's all the information that I have. 
17 years ago, God started me on a journey where He changed me. He sent me on a missions trip overseas for the first time. I got out of my world, my culture, and I saw unbelievable need that I had never been aware of. But what grabbed my heart? I started to meet so many missionaries who were serving God in different places, and their biggest burden, their biggest concern was they didn't have enough money to be there. And they weren't allowed to work because they were missionaries. And I just had a passion for seeing these people be blessed and money not being an issue for them. Well, coming back from that mission trip, a missionary who knew that I was a businessman challenged me with something I had never heard before. You may have heard of this. It's called the Prayer of Jabez. It's right there in First Chronicles in this long list of who began who. And this one little verse that kind of pauses and it says, and Jabez was a righteous man. And he asked the host of Israel, the God of Israel, to bless him, to bless him indeed, to expand his territory, to see God's hand in his business, and to protect him from harm. And the scripture says, and God granted his request. Well, this missionary said to me, Mike, I can challenge you. Pray that prayer over your business for 30 days and see what happens. I said, okay. And he taught me how to pray. God, bless my business. Bless it indeed. God, expand the territory of my business. God, let me see your hand in my business. And God, please protect me from harm. Folks, I'm here to tell you as a witness at the end of 30 days, my business revenues had doubled. Now, in my immaturity at that time, here's what I thought. I found some magic words in the Old Testament. <laughs> going to keep praying that that was not all what God's message was. He used that initially to bless me and get my attention that he wanted to take me on a journey. Now here was the first place of training that he did for me on that journey. You see, I've been a businessman in the financial services world for over 20 years at that time. I had been trained by the world that I was responsible for my success. And I did all the things that they teach you in the business world about how to meet more people and offer more things and do all of these things. And it all came down to I was the one that measured how successful I was but whether or not I was broken. Well, I learned that's not God's way. And here's what it was taught to me. In my business, as in my life, I have a role, God has a role. Amen. Here was my role. Now this is so profoundly simple, but I really needed to get in mind, in mind and practice. My first responsibility, first of three, was to show up. I get up and I go to work. I don't sleep half the day. Showing up at work means I show up prepared. So being in financial services, I didn't take that casually. I've done a lot of studying, gotten a lot of education, become a student of that, so that when I show up, I show up with faith. Second thing is my responsibility, complete honesty. Now in what I do in financial advising, I expect some of you here would say you've had situations where you weren't so sure that person giving you advice wasn't more interested in themselves than you. Well, here's what honesty means to me. Many times when I'm working with people, I recognize they don't even know the right questions to ask about money. And I need to teach them first so that they can make a decision. And sometimes having taught that, they say, thank you, I never knew that. Now that I know it, I don't want to do what you think I should do. Okay, but my responsibility is honesty. My third responsibility, walking a life of integrity. Here's how I translated that in my business. When I speak to my clients, I have said this to them. If you ever were to witness me checking into a hotel with someone other than Mary, would you not say to yourself, if he's cheating on her, do we want to trust him with our money? That's what integrity is. 
Now, as I started practicing those things, showing up complete honesty and a life of integrity, I released God to bless me. You want to hear what that journey looked like? How many of you remember 9-11? I call that a 9-11 type moment that when I asked that question, I bet what was in your mind, you remember where you were, what you heard, what you saw, you remember that. It's something that we retain in the memory because it made an impact. I had three of those moments in my journey with God. Here was the first one. God spoke to me very specifically, and this is what he said. Mike, I want you to get away from the tithe and start giving 25%. I'm a business guy. I didn't offer any resistance to God because I'd already experienced His blessing. I just said, okay. I started changing the numbers because now my in-go and out-go is different. And two things I observed happened after God spoke and I started doing that. The first was, I would used to be giving 10% and keeping 90%. Now I was giving 25 and keeping 75. The 75 was more than the 90 had been. It was that parable of the loaves and fishes. More and more and more kept coming out. It was God doing the blessing. Here's the second thing that I observed. What to do with that extra money. Now I believe and I do offer instruction that the tithe belongs to the church. So I kept right on tithing and giving that amount to the church, but now I had 15% over and above the church. That was an offering. You see, a tithe is a 10% out of your income, and an offering is that over and above your income. Mary was talking to a friend a few years ago, and they were talking about Joyce Meyer ministry. And this lady said she loved Joyce so much she was sending her all of her tithe. And Mary said to her, we love Joyce too, we support her, but your tithe belongs to the church. You give to ministries like that as an offering. See, that's the difference in what the scripture. So now I had an opportunity to start giving, and God just opened the doors to missionaries and people in missions that I wanted to invest his money that he was blessing me with. The very first person that God brought into relationship was a good friend. Scott was leaving the business world and was going into ministry full time as a chaplain in the Orange County Jail down in Orlando. And I felt encouraged by God to go to Scott and ask him, are you raising support? He said, yes. I said, I'd like to be your first supporter. And I started pledging money for his support, <coughs> supporting him for over 15 years while he was in that ministry. Now here's what God blessed me by. One afternoon, doorbell rings at my home. I go to the front door, and there is Scott unannounced. And has this young kid, looks to be about 20, standing there with him, kind of a scruffy-looking young kid. And Scott comes in. He apologizes for the interruption. He said, I just had somebody that wanted to meet you. Well, this young man starts to talk. He says, hey, my name is Robert. I made some pretty bad choices in my life. I ended up going to jail. While I was in jail, I met your friend Scott here. He was coming here teaching us the Bible all the time. Because he came here and taught us the Bible, I'm now following this dude you call Jesus. Amen. And Bob said, Robert said, and one day I asked Scott, don't you work for a living? Don't you have a job? How can you come in here to the jail all the time? How do you pay your bills? And he said, Scott, tell me, told me, this is my ministry. Other people support me so that I can come here and be in the jail. And Robert said, I asked Scott if they ever let me out of here, would you take me to meet some of those people? This young man stuck out his hand, took mine, and said, I came here to say thanks. Now here's what God showed me. Generous giving is an investment in somebody's eternity. Amen. Amen. Guess what Robert's doing today? He's a chaplain in the Orange County Jail.
So I was loving this, having opportunities to, to invest God's money. What God had, He wasn't done yet. Second time He spoke to me, it was a little bit shorter. This is what He said. Mike, let's take it to 40%. And I'll tell you folks, here's exactly what I said back to God. Gee, God, that's great. Where is this going to end? <laughs> At that time in my life, in the journey and the people that God had introduced me to, I had met some people that God had extraordinarily blessed in gifts of business and money who were giving 90% and living on 10. And even their 10 was a great life. We never talked about that in our church. I didn't even know it was possible. So once again, I've got the same time to walk this out. And that was, I just changed the numbers. The church still gets the 10. I've got more to give. Now, I am giving 40%, so I'm keeping 60. Looked at the numbers a little while later. Guess what? The 60 that I'm keeping is more than the 75 that I did have before. And that was more than the 90. That's how God proves that he, we cannot outgive him. Well, even more opportunities start to open up. Because now I feel like I'm an investment banker for God. And looking for opportunities to invest his money. And he bought another opportunity. Now, I had been going back and forth on these missions trips uh, overseas for a number of years. I was divorced at the time. I kind of said to God, I'm over the marriage thing. Don't ever want to think about that again. I'm okay. I love being single. I love having my life. All of that. that. And while I was on a missions trip, I met a missionary who was single, had never been married. She was in Ukraine serving full time. And it became apparent right then, I think even she is an answer to prayer because I had been asking God, could I just have a woman as a friend? Not for my dating, not for anything, just a, a mature, godly woman that I could have for a friend. And we discovered that in a two-week period that we were there on the mission field. Well, at the end of that two weeks, she went back to Ukraine, I came back to Florida. But we exchanged email addresses and had a one-year long-term relationship. And Mary and I have been married for 11 and a half years. God wanted to bless me and give me a live-in, in-house missionary of my own. <laughs> well, during this time that we were, um, before we were married, my friend Scott introduced me to his boss, a fellow named Harry. Harry is the international director of all of the prison ministries <coughs> all over the world in this organization called Good News. Harry came to me, he pulled me aside, and this is what he said to me. He said, Mike, I'm wondering something. He said, when you get married to Mary in a couple months, she's not going to be on the mission field in Ukraine anymore, is she? I said, no. He said, does that cause you any concern? I said, you bet. God sent her there as a missionary, and she marries me. Won't be doing that anymore. I want to make sure I don't mess this up. Well, Harry says, how would you like to do something as a tribute to me? I said, what is it? He said, I've got two chaplains in the Ukraine, same country that she lived in, who don't have anybody to support them and go into the prison. He said, in that country, in that culture, a full support for a chaplain in a jail is $100 a month. What can you do? I said, I'll take both. And we started sending $200 a month to these two chaplains. We've never met them who minister in the jail. Now, Harris sends us a report every year of what these chaplains have done. And that report tells us how many Bible studies they had, how many counseling sessions, how many people accepted Jesus in Ukrainian prisons. And that number runs about 60 a year. 60 a year. Let me do the math for you. $200 a month, $2,400. 
60 souls, a soul one to Jesus, and the jails of Ukraine, about 60 dollars. God gave me a new passion in showing me that, to have expectation when we give and we invest his money. Well, Harry, to finish that story, he called me up in January of this year. He said, Mike, I just got back. I went over to Ukraine. I visited with your two chaplains, and I found out something about them that you should know. I learned when I was there that both of these chaplains were taking one half of what you gave them, $50, $100 a month. They were taking one half of that and buying things for the people in prison. He said, when I learned of that, I immediately doubled their salary. Can you cover that? I said, you bet. Because I already knew how to expect from God what he